Hello, whenever and wherever you might be listening to us, you, we are the Guam by Podcast. Guam by Podcast brought to you by the Dillo Brewing Company and Museum. Dillo Brewing Company located in beautiful downtown Dillo, home of the Dildo sign erected by Honorary Mayor Jimmy Kimmel himself, sister city to Cal- Hollywood, California. We're glad you're with us. My name is Kevin George, and I am coming to you from London, Ontario. And I am Daryl George, and I'm coming from the motherland here in Whiteway, Newfoundland and Labrador. Now, what do you got in store for me today? I, I'm afraid to ask, actually. But You know, the last few years, you know, with the pandemic and stuff, I guess, uh, I'm sure you've been watching a lot of movies, have you? Oh, yeah. Don't stop. Lots of time on your hands? All the time to sit, my son, nothing. Only feet up, feet up, remote in hand, that's me. I'm in my lazy boy, being a lazy boy. Have you watched any Newfoundland mu- movies? Uh, I think I rewatched a couple of ones that that we saw, you know, when they came out years ago. That were right on, uh, on the Netflix type thing, right? Oh, okay. Well, I'm gonna. That's that's where we're gonna go today. We're gonna have a look at movies that are either about Newfoundland or made here in Newfoundland. That sort of thing. I think you'll be surprised to find um, uh, the number of movies and the types of movies that have been made here. Actually, so we're gonna have a look at that and see. We're gonna test your knowledge of movies you've seen and some movies you haven't seen you know what i'm not going to be surprised by i'm not going to be surprised at how very little i know about this <laughs> now nah, i'm sure you'll do fine you've done really well so far so uh, no reason why you're not going to do well at the movies i'm like when you ask me questions i do give you a little warm-up question so i'm going to give you our little warm-up question here at the top we usually give you a newfoundland term and uh, kind of get you reacquainted with your native newfoundland language right here's a word for you dotteril Ooh. A dotero. Dotero. And I really don't know how to pronounce these half the time, but I'll give it a try. Well, which you're asking me something that you have such a great command of yourself. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> obviously, obviously, I don't use the word very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ever, I think that would be. I'll give it to you in a sentence. No multiple choice. I'll just okay. give it to you in a sentence. Give it to you me in a sentence and then see okay. if I can. Okay. Here's the sentence. Uncle Jimmy would often lose his way when he went into the woods hunting rabbits. He was a real dotero. Ooh. He, uh, he was a person with no sense of direction. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, well, that's, uh, that's pretty close, actually. So a person who is a daughter would probably have very little sense of direction. Uh, it's a feeble-minded person. Well, that's yeah, why so. the reason I didn't get this right is because I am, in fact, a daughter <laughs> <laughs> There you go. <laughs> <laughs> there's no there's no hidden message there. I wonder no, as to why thanks, I picked this Darryl. particular word. Thanks, Daryl, for pointing but out the it, obvious. It, apparently, it also refers to a two-legged seabird, too. Well, Daryl, we have a contest that we need to deal with from our friends at Crooked Arse Creations. We've got a beautiful Jesus, Mary, and Joseph t-shirt to give away. Again, uh, from our last uh, show, where I believe the question was, who uh, learned how to ride their bike on the streets of St. John's? Wasn't that the question, Daryl? That was the question, and the answer was Jugmeet Singh. It was indeed. Tony Marie said that Jugmeet Singh learned how to ride his bike on the streets of St. John's. We put everybody's name onto the, the, the wheel of names here. And one lucky person is going to win a Jesus, Mary, and Joseph t-shirt. Right so spin that wheel, Kevin. There we go. Make sure you get around at least once. I'm going to get the dollar, I wonder, or five cents. There it goes. Where it stops, nobody knows. We have a winner, Daryl. Who is it? The lucky winner is Angela Mention. Angela Mention, congratulations. You are the proud owner of a brand new, because we don't give out you shirts, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph shirt. <clears throat> Better move on. Have a uh, try and try your hand at some movie trivia. All right, let's hear the movie. I will have to say at the beginning, though, spoiler alert, yeah. we could be giving away some plots of some of these movies. So true, eh, true. if you want to watch them, you've never watched them before, you might want to so, be careful. Is this the Newfoundland version of Siskel and Ebert? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think that would be a bit of a stretch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> have you ever heard the expression, this is Newfoundland, not Disneyland? Yes, on all the ads that we get up here. We get a bunch of those Newfoundland ads here in Ontario, and that's on the adverts. It says that? Yes, it actually says. Go this away, is, by. I should say go on by. For this particular uh, episode, anyway, we're going to consider us uh, Disneyland, I suppose, or Hollywood okay. North or something yeah. close to that. So there's a movie um, shot this past summer. Come a on. A Disney movie here oh, in Newfoundland. Okay. Yeah, or actually, part, I shouldn't say shot here in Newfoundland. Part of the movie was shot here in Newfoundland. And uh, it was a Disney movie. And uh, the name of the movie. Have I got to guess? Well, you can guess. Peter Pan. Peter Pan is right. All right. I got one right. Well, Peter Pan and Wendy actually is the name. 
Oh, okay. Well, I didn't get it right. But so you were close. <laughs> I know it close. was about Peter Pan. Uh, do you know where the um, where it was shot to? Where the Newfoundland location that was used? Kitty Vitty? Well, they may have shot something in Kitty Vitty, but primarily the shots were in a particular region of Newfoundland. Region. One that several other movies have been shot in. Oh, so probably way. over in, in Trinity Bay, over in the English Harbor area and Random Island. Yeah, and, Bonavista yeah. Peninsula. Bonavista Peninsula, yeah. Peter Pan is going to be in Newfoundland, yeah. Yeah, well, that's awesome. That's a good way to look at, uh, I guess, going from the current all the way back to perhaps the one, you know, the original big Hollywood movie that was filmed here in Newfoundland. It was called The Viking and released 1931. That's how far back we're going here now. So the plot, Kevin, uh, of this movie, it's set on the coast of Newfoundland mm -hmm. and a rivalry develops between Jed Nelson, a seal hunter, and Luke Orham, a local man who's considered a jinx. Mm -hmm. Jed is worried that his rival may try to steal his girlfriend, Mary Jo. Calling him a coward, the seal hunter, Jed, goads Luke into accompanying him on an Arctic sealing expedition on a ship that's commanded by a Captain Barker. They both end up in a hunting party on the ice floes and eventually find themselves stranded. Jed tries to kill Luke, but the snow blinds him and his gunshot misses. Despite the attempt on his life, Luke helps walk the blinded Jed across the ice floes back to Newfoundland after they are unable to return to the ship. On recovering his sight at home, Jed gains new respect for his rival and vows he will beat senseless any man who derides the character of his new friend. Now that you know the, the, the background, I'll ask you a few things about it. All right, let's hear it. So the original name for this movie was going to be White Thunder, mm. but they changed the name of the movie to The Viking. What was The Viking in the title of the film referring to? I can give you multiple choice. Um, I'll make or a you can take a, take a stab at it. I'll take, take a, a wall guess. I'll say that was the name of their ship. It was the name of the ship. And I'll tell you why they changed the name in a little bit. It was a sealing vessel, actually. It was a Norwegian-built sealing vessel. It was owned by Bowering Brothers of St. John's, which, not surprising, given the size of the as sure. a sealing merchant company they were. The movie itself was produced by a man by the name of Varric Frizzell. He was an American from New York, very rich guy, got a, you know, like rich people did, I suppose, back in those days, got a camera for a, for a present and started taking films of, of different things. Okay. So his first, he, he went to Labrador in 1928, actually, and the first short film that he produced was like a documentary film. It was actually called The Lure of Labrador. And you can watch this film. If you go on YouTube, you can actually see this film today. It's about 13 minutes long. And he travels up the Hamilton or Churchill River or Grand River. And uh, he actually, uh, you know, there's some fantastic footage in this particular little documentary. Actually has what many feel is the first time that the Grand Falls or the Churchill Falls was ever filmed on, on video or on tape. Mm. He also did another one called The Great Arctic Seal Hunt in 1928 as well. And he took that to uh, Hollywood uh, to seek funding. Uh, for a second documentary and they actually decided that's where they decided to give him funding to turn it into a feature length movie instead the yeah. hollywood studios agreed to give him uh, money to do the feature film how much did he get to do this film was it fifty thousand dollars a hundred thousand dollars five hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars i will guess fifty thousand dollars it was $100,000, which in the 1930s, you can imagine, was a yeah. pretty tidy sum of money. It's a big budget film. Uh, the movie had two firsts, though. Any idea what they might have been? Now, 1931. Just think about that. Uh, I, I have no idea. No. Uh, it was actually the first to have sound and dialogue captured on location in a Hollywood feature. In other words, yeah, so outside, outside of... Yeah, outside the yeah. studio. Wow. And it was the first sync sound picture to be produced in Canada. In other words, sound uh, happening with the action at the same time. So, yeah, it was uh, quite the movie, really, for the time. Um, unfortunately, you know, the movie itself didn't do very well. It was not considered to have had, uh, despite your uh, the, the plot that I told you, it wasn't yeah, well, really considered I mean, shocking to be that great. It is. And uh, remember I told you about the movie having a different name? Well, here's what happened at the end. He wasn't happy with the, some of the shots that he received, that he had done up on the ice. Yeah. So 
he actually decided to come back and reshoot some of the scenes out on the ice and out seal hunting. And while they went out for their last trip, for that trip, um, disaster befell the Viking, actually, while at sea. Mm. And my trivia question for you is, well, what happened to the Viking? And I'll give you four cho- or give you three choices, actually. Like this. No, I'll give you four. Right. First choice. She was crushed by the ice and sank. Okay. An explosion on board the vessel, which was loaded with dynamite for ice breaking, blew the ship to pieces. She hid an iceberg near Fogo Island and sank. Or on the way home from the seal hunt and loaded with seal pelts, she sank in a vicious nor'easter. I think D sounds most plausible. Or A, but I'll go with D. I think A and D are plausible. Not right, though. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the answer was that uh, there was an explosion on board. The oh, vessel, come on. Which so was that was loaded real, with dynamite. I thought, it, I thought it was a part of the Hollywood plot. Yeah, well, the thing is that it was common to take dynamite on these ships for icebreaking, but they took more on this particular trip because of the special effects that they were attempting to do for the movie. Mm. So she had a lot of um, dynamite on board. But, um, I won't go into too many details on that, uh, other than to say that I'm, I'm very tragically, 29 men were killed, including Frizzell himself. I did want to ask you one other question about a couple, actually a couple other questions. Do you remember I mentioned a Captain Barker? Yes. On this sealing vessel? Yes. Uh, He was a Newfoundland Labrador sea captain. Do you know the name of the captain who played the sealing uh, Captain Barker in the film? I guess I'll give you a hint on this to be fair to you. He was an actual sea captain. And he actually had speaking lines in the film, by the way. He actually spoke in the film. Was it? It's probably, no, what I'm thinking is too early. I think was it Captain Bartlett? Indeed, it was. It was okay, Captain okay. Captain Bob Bartlett of Brigus. There you go. Uh, you know, the most famous Newfoundland sea captain of all time, of course. Who even infamous? Went on. Yeah, absolutely. He went on um, forty expeditions to the Arctic, actually. And see, now I I don't know about the rest of you out there, but I got to say this: I just learned that Captain Bob Bartlett was a Hollywood movie star. So, Kevin, have you ever heard tell of the Rowdy Men? Oh yes, classic Newfoundland movie. Yeah, so I've, I've never I've seen taken, it, I have to admit, but I have heard never of it. seen the Rowdy Man. Okay, I have so never we're seen it. We're two for two on movies you haven't seen. So the Rowdy Men were, were a long ways now up in history, went from 1931 all the way up to 1971 72 now. Okay, so I think you might have been born at this point, but just barely. 71 is a great year, is all I'm gonna say. But okay, so it was released in 72, so yeah, although I don't think uh. I don't think mom and dad took you to very many movies. Warren wasn't going days. to the picture shows in 72. <laughs> no, or any other year for that matter. <laughs> but anyway, so let me give you the plot then to this movie, because if you don't know anything about it, it's uh, better for me to tell you a little bit about the movie. Uh, the main character's name is Will Cole. And Will Cole's philosophy on life is, well, you probably might laugh at this, <laughs> seduce it if it moves and drink it if it pours. <laughs> I am getting that on a t-shirt. <laughs> So uh, Will Cole, who's played by Pinson, by the way, he's yeah. in his thirties, lives in a small town, in Newfoundland. He sees yeah. no reason to take life seriously at all. I love the man. He's constant, he, <laughs> he constantly has something up his sleeve, yeah. but for the people in his life, his pranks and antics bring tragedy and pain. His friend, Andrew, dies uh, in the movie. The only woman he cares about becomes suicidal and the um, old man in the movie uh, who was his mentor, dies while uh, oh Will God. is pushing him in a wheelchair. Now do you, That's now the, do you, plot? Is the plot? Now do you, <laughs> the plot is the guy in a wheelchair dies? That's how it ends? Oh, my God. I did not say that's how it ends. Okay. That's okay. just some of the things that happen. Oh, all right. Okay, uh, I got you. I won't tell you what happens okay, at the we'll end. Okay, we'll keep that because I'm going to try and find it. So the movie itself was set in small town Newfoundland. Where was most of the filming for this particular movie completed? And it was in one of our towns. I, I think it had to be, a, a more, I, I'll say like in and around St. John's. Okay. Well, you're partially right because there were, you know, a half a dozen scenes perhaps that were filmed in St. John's, but that wasn't where the primary show was located. The movie itself was actually set in Cornerbrook. Oh, okay. All right. West Coast yeah. movie. Right. And so it was uh, the idea of a mill town. Of course, Gordon Princeton is actually yes. from Grand Falls, Grand which Falls. was Another the original, town. well, the original mill town here in Newfoundland, Labrador. Yep. And um, so he, you know, he wrote the film really based on what he knew, which was, you know, life in a mill town. And um, so I did tell you about the guy uh, sadly dying in the wheelchair. Yeah. 
So during, this was in the earlier part of the movie, uh, Pinson's character travels to St. John's to visit the old man. And uh, the old man is like, uh, uh, for Pinson, it's, he's, a, he's a character with wisdom who, you know, kind of is his mentor, really. Mm -hmm. The actor who portrayed the old man is a well-known Hollywood actor Oof. who starred in one of the most popular television shows of the 1970s. Do you know what his name was? No. So I'm going to give you four guesses. Okay. Is it Robert Conrad, Will Gear, Hal Linden, or Jack Lord? I'll go. I, for some reason, I feel like a, I'll go with Gear. I right again. Woohoo! <laughs> Nothing but a guess. So you. Well, you're you're getting <laughs> you get most of even the guesses right. So it's good for you. That's that's great. Uh, but do you, do you know what show he acted in? in uh, that's what I'm trying to remember. I cannot remember. What was it? Well, he was an old man in that show, too. He was the grandpa on The Waltons. The Waltons. Yes, that's it. And if you watch, go and watch The Rowdy Men. I'll tell you, his character in this particular movie is fantastic. Very well cast mm, uh, to be, uh, you know, that, that, that older, wiser guy kind of uh, telling yeah. Will what he should be doing with his life and, and yeah. the mistakes that, that, that he made. First one being his slogan. <laughs> maybe, maybe so yeah. i think so on his trip to st john's the movie shows a shot of st john's harbor with men playing soccer on the waterfront uh, with the backdrop of a fleet of ships in the background do you know what the name of the ships were am i getting multiple guests here uh, no you're getting a hint okay they were they were well-known fishing fleet that fished the grand banks for centuries and they visited st john's harbor often they were the white fleet yeah the white fleet will cole's best friend his name Jim. was Andrew. He dies in the film. How does he meet his untimely end? <laughs> and I will give you a multiple choice because you haven't seen the movie. Does he die in a fight at a local at the local legion? That's plausible. He it falls is. into a piece of equipment. He commits suicide, or he dies of a ski accident on Marble Mountain. I'm going to say he died by suicide. Uh, actually, he dies falling into a piece of equipment in the in paper the mill. mill. With a lot of movies, all movies, I guess, you have to have a lot of extras and people playing bit parts. Yes. One person who got cast was a laid off mill worker and his name was Dave Street. He's actually the guy, if you watch the movie, he's the guy in the opening sequence who Pinson's character, Will Cole, has his head pinned in the toilet in the bathroom while they're fighting. Oh. So when interviewed recently about this, Dave Street said that uh, you know, he was unemployed. He went down and tried out for the non-speaking part in the film. I'm going to ask you, how much did he get paid? And I'll give you four choices. So, so, you you're, so you're saying him having his head in a toilet bowl is a non-speaking part? Not, yeah, non-speaking part. <laughs> I'd say it's non-speaking. <laughs> so how much money did he get for sticking his head in the toilet? 82 okay. bucks, $102, $132, or $152? I think $132. He actually got $152, which was more Ooh. than he was making at the mill when he got laid off. Jesus, that's big money to get your head shuffled. I, actually, if you offered me $152 right now, I might let you put my head in the toilet. If you're listening out there, folks, and you got $152 to spare, my head is free. Yeah, you got to find a toilet big enough to stick your head in. <laughs> <laughs> that wins. That's the winning line in this podcast right there. I'll give that one to Daryl. <laughs> I love it. What do you think the budget for the Rowdy Men was? You and your budgets. Yeah. $100,000, $250,000, $350,000, or $500,000. Featured length movie shot in Newfoundland, written by a Newfoundlander. Okay, you're again. You're close. It was three hundred. But now you, you know. I mean, you haven't seen this movie, so I got to give no. you a bit of leeway on this. Three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Imagine that in today's money. That's eight million dollar budget. That's pretty that, good for a Canadian movie, isn't it? That will be a big film in Canada. Yep. So the thing with the movie, if you can you can see it on YouTube, yeah. uh, but that's oh. about the only place you're ever going to see this movie. Apparently, the ownership of the movie is in dispute. Oh. Uh, nobody really knows quite who owns it and as a result it's really hindered the ability of um, different groups to be able to uh, you know restore and re-release the movie uh, but i would certainly encourage anybody and everybody who has any kind of connection to newfoundland to have a look at this movie um it has great historical significance even if nothing else than just the the shots of cornerbrook and st john's and that sort of thing you know real time capsule i gotta tell you it's a real time capsule so your early 70s newfoundland labrador all right, Kevin, we're going to move now into the mid to late 70s for you. Yeah, this one's going to be, this one's an action movie. Orca, Orca, the killer whale. Yes, or as I call it, the Newfoundland Jaws. 
the Newfoundland Jaws was very much a, you know, a spinoff or a takeoff of the Jaws success at that particular mm-hmm. time. And uh, so whale and shark and fish movies were all the rage. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So what better place to film a movie about whales than Newfoundland? So Hollywood came calling to Newfoundland yes. for a backdrop for this big, big budget movie. Actually, it was um, a movie that had a, a budget of over six million dollars. Actually, have you ever saw? Have you see this movie? I have seen this movie, but I, I'm going to guess I saw it like I don't know, thirty five or forty years ago. Mm. I watched it a little while ago. And the movie itself had uh, some big Hollywood stars in it. Richard Harris was the star of the movie. Mm-hmm who incidentally portrayed Professor Dumbledore in the Harry Potter films. So the film itself grossed $3.5 million in its opening weekend alone and over 14, 15, almost $15 million in the United States and Canada. So it was, you know, it was a successful movie. Do you know where most of the filming for this particular movie took place? I feel like it was Petty Harbor. I feel like I don't need to give you any multiple choice on that one. It, it indeed was Petty Harbor. Yeah. Not exclusively in Petty Harbor, I don't think. I think there was some other... Mm. scenes on other parts of the east coast there yeah do you remember this this is gonna be a hard one for you perhaps do you remember the fictional name that they placed on the village of petty harbor for this particular movie oh yeah that's hard was it remote harbor north harbor south harbor or petty harbor i'll say it was north harbor it's south harbor yeah spoiler alert again i'm going to give you the plot so a whale hunter decides to try to capture a killer whale to pay off his debts like you would right like you would but everything goes wrong. Of course. It uh, when he goes to kill, all goes wrong. When he kills the pregnant female partner of a male killer whale. The male killer whale seeks revenge on the captain. The whale then terrorizes the town, sinking boats, starting a huge gas fire, tearing down a seaside house, leading to eating off the leg of one of the female characters. <sighs> Do you remember that? Yeah, it's rough. Very dramatic. Very, very dramatic. Very, yeah. She doesn't die. But, um, she this doesn't would be, I just got to say, life. this would be, <laughs> this would make the news in Petty Harbor. Like this would be on the evening news. Oh, yeah. Who was the American actress who lost her leg? Oh. I'm not going to give you a multiple guess. I'm going to give you a hint. Okay. Instead. Okay. She also starred in the movie 10 with Dudley Moore. Oh, God. I do know the answer to this. Uh, what's the answer? No, not even a guess, eh? Her name is Bo Derrick. Bo Derrick, for God's sake. The battle between the captain and his crew continues from there. And um, the final battle actually happens, supposed to be off the coast of Labrador. The main orcas that were used in filming were, you know, they were artificial rubber whales. But here's an interesting little thing that happened. On the way, the transporting the whales to the filming location, they were actually stopped by animal rights activists they blocked the trucks because they thought the orcas were actually real that's how <laughs> lifelike they were awesome oh, the yeah. polar scenes here's the last little piece that i'll give you the polar scenes there's this whole elaborate set of ice and icebergs and the whole bit supposed to be off the coast of labrador was actually shot in malta of Come all on. places really absolutely honest to god malta labrador what's the difference same same so the other whale movie that you mentioned there a little bit ago was A Whale for the Killing. You remember that movie as well, do you? I do. In fact, I think I was saying that the two end up blending together in my mind a lot. So, But I do A Whale for the Killing. Wasn't that a Farley Mowat thing? Yeah, well, it was based on a Farley Mowat novel, yeah. Yeah. A Whale for the Killing. Yeah. And um, so do, you, do you, you know where this one was filmed for sure? I thought it was filmed in Petty Harbor as well. Yeah, it was. And, and yeah. therefore, obviously... Yeah. The similarities between the two movies. They're filmed very close together in terms of time as well. This one was around 1980. And um, there were a lot of the scenes were also in Kitty Vitty as well in this particular okay. one. Uh, a very different Kitty Vitty than you'd see today. No That's doubt about sure. that. Yeah. Much, much changed from back in those days. So very briefly here, the plot of this movie was uh, you've got a New Yorker uh, mm-hmm. sailing on a, a yacht that gets in trouble him and his wife and two kids. The storm forces them into a small coastal village in Newfoundland. Once there, they discover that the uh, storm has also trapped a whale in a local bay. While most of the locals want to kill the whale and sell it to the Russian company, there's a Russian ship offshore willing to buy, a Russian whaling ship willing to buy the uh, whale. 
this particular guy, the New Yorker who he's an ecologist and he seeks to prevent that particular ending, of course. And with the help of one, at least one townsman anyway, uh, he tries to prevent that from happening. The movie and the book was actually loosely based on a real story. I don't know if you knew that or not, because a actual real whale did get trapped in a saltwater lagoon in a Newfoundland outport that Farley Mowat was um, living in. Mm. Do you know the name of the outport? It was on the south coast. So it was either Harbor Breton, Fortune, Burgio, or Ramia. Burgio. It was Burgio. And you know that because you know that Farley Mowat lived in Burgio for, I think, about eight years, actually. Yeah, yeah. They didn't call it Burgio in the film or the book. Uh, they called it uh, Barisway. Ah. Uh, so we'll start with the whale. Do you yeah. know what kind of whale that was actually trapped in Burgio? The one that was actually trapped was probably a right whale. Mm, close again, but not I'm always there. close. A blue whale. You're always close. It was a fin whale. Fin whale. Okay. Fin whale, which is the second largest whale species on Earth, actually. Yes, second yeah. only to the blue whale. In the movie, however, it wasn't a fin whale. It was no. another type of whale. So Want to get a guess yeah. on that one? It a was, humpback. yeah. Humpback. They, they, uh, they substituted a humpback whale in instead. So as I said, the incident happened in Burgio. Uh, it happened um, in the early 70s. And in the real life story, uh, the whale does die in the end. So, yeah. So it was... Uh, Sad, sad end to a sad episode and really kind of harkens back to uh, a little bit of a different day sure. in Newfoundland back in those days, of course, and we're, we're familiar with that ourselves. A few things about the movie itself. There were several Newfoundland actors that appeared in the movie. Uh, one of the most prominent ones was a guy by the name of David Ferry, who was born in St. John's. There were two other prominent Newfoundlanders who appeared. The first was a member of CODCO and the WGB. You know who I might be referring to? Um, I'm going to say Greg Malone. Okay. Again, I'm only close. Tommy you're only close. Yes. Tommy Sexton. Okay. <laughs> he doesn't have a speaking part, but he does. He's, he's there as one of the graduating students in one scene. And he's also one of the young people shooting at the whale in another oh. scene, but he doesn't, yeah. he doesn't actually speak. Okay. The other young lad who was from Petty Harbor, um, who was an extra in one of the scenes, uh, he's on the bridge or he's seen on the bridge in town. Do you know who that is? The boy on the bridge? The boy is on the it, bridge. Is it the boy on the bridge? That's uh, our friend Alan Doyle, isn't it? That's Alan Doyle himself, yeah. Before moving on, Kevin, I do want to mention one actor in the movie. I think it's, it's an interesting little sidebar. Okay. The main character in the movie is Charles Landon. His wife is Janet Landon, and the wife is played by actress Dee Wallace. What other blockbuster movie from the 1980s did Dee Wallace star in as the mother in the film? Was it Jaws, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Indiana Jones, or E.T., the extraterrestrial? I think it was E.T. Indeed it was. Your oh, back oh, on I track wasn't here. even close on that one, folks. I was right she on She was target. the mother. Dee Wallace was the mother in E.T., the extraterrestrial. And she was also the mother in A Whale for the Killing, shot here in Newfoundland and Labrador, Petty Harbor. That's it. See, you know. One final question okay. on A Whale for the Killing. Also thought this was an interesting tidbit. Do you know the name of the production company that produced the film? Mm. Not going to give you multiple choice, but I'm going to give you several clues. Okay. Start with the first clue. The first clue is they were not one of the big movie studios. That's not helpful, is it? That's a great clue. <laughs> so it's none of those that you were thinking of. Okay, so that's out. <clears throat> They're more known for producing magazines than films. Ooh, Time Warner. Okay. Last clue. Okay. Listen carefully. Okay. Their magazines were well known for great articles. <laughs> was it produced by Playboy? Indeed it was. <laughs> you're, on a <laughs> you're on a street. It was oh, Playboy yeah. Productions that produced there was no movie. street. There's no streaking involved in the production of this <clears throat> podcast, folks. <laughs> All right, Kevin, we're going to move into the late 80s. Now, this is a time when you're much, much more familiar with, I'm sure. This is your, yes. back, in your back in your heyday. I'm going to go back to Gordon Pinson. Now, you can't really talk about movies in Newfoundland very long before Gordon Pinson comes back on the scene because he really is uh, all things Newfoundland Labrador when it comes to movies. Like the Rowdy Men, Gordon Pinson wrote and starred in 
another movie called John and the Misses. Oh, great movie. And that was set here in Newfoundland, Labrador, filmed here in Newfoundland, Labrador in 1987. It's a romantic drama, mm -hmm. unfolds in the early 60s, when mm -hmm. the future of an isolated mining community is threatened by the government's planned resettlement program. There's a cave-in at the mine, and of course, that gives the government the opportunity to close the mine. The main character, John, fights back to save the mine and the town that he loves. And of course, that struggle tests his love of him and his missus and for the family and um, John's own sense of his self. So I'm going to ask you a few questions about John and the missus. You saw this movie? Many, many moons ago, yes. Yeah. I remember seeing it in the theater. Actually, it was a big deal to actually go mm -hmm. into a movie theater on the big screen to be able to watch something that wasn't only shot here in Newfoundland Labrador, but was about Newfoundland Labrador, right? That's right. Yep. So the main character, John, insists at one point in the movie that if he moved away, this is what would happen. So I'm going to give you four choices of what okay. would happen if he moved away. You tell me which one is the right answer. First one, A, they'd sell me shirts that don't keep out the wind. Okay. Second one, we'd be drinking at a, other people's cups saying grace at other people's tables. I wouldn't have a pot to piss in, and then I would shrivel up and die. Or D, I wouldn't know if I was coming or going. I'd be at me wit's end. Um, boy, we'll be drinking out of other people's cups and saying grace at other people's tables. Definitely was. I'd be drinking yeah. out of other people's cups and saying grace at other people's tables. Yeah. So when resistance proves futile, what does Pinson's character in the film do? Does he... He uproots his house and sails away. He commits suicide. He decides he's not leaving and remains as the only resident of the community. Mm. Or he runs for political office and gets elected as the area MHA. <laughs> the the uh, MHA for Cup Cove. I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna say, sorry, say the third one again. Third one is he decides he's not leaving at all. and He, re he remains there as the only resident of the community. Uh, yeah, I think that's the answer. Okay, unlike uh, the family, the uh, gentleman and his wife who have stayed in Little Bay Island, yeah, he, he did, did exactly that. that. So he just, this uh, guy up, uprooted his house then and left. He uprooted his house and sailed away. Right. In fact, the movie poster shows the house floating. Floating away. So like many houses in Newfoundland resettlement, of course, they were floated away. Yeah. Rare Birds. Oh, Rare Birds. Not a great movie. How about this one? You see this one? I did. So the movie itself, is, this one is a comedy. Yes. You asked funny. earlier, Newfoundland movie is a comedy. This one's definitely a comedy. And of course, Rare Birds, nothing new in Newfoundland, I suppose. Is a, no, a, lot geez, of, I, a lot of rare birds here. <laughs> they even expelled at least one rare bird. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of rare birds, the, both uh, human and otherwise. This is a movie that was shot entirely here in Newfoundland, in Outer Cove, Petty Harbor, Cape Spear, that area of... Uh, St. John's area and an outlying yeah. area. Dave is uh, having some hard luck. Uh, he misses his wife in Washington, who's living in Washington, even though he's here in Newfoundland running a restaurant. The restaurant is called The Ock. It's located in Push Through Cove, and <laughs> it's not doing very well, as I said. Uh, he's got a next-door neighbor named Fonts. Oh, yeah. Played by Great Andy name. Jones. Great name, too. Yeah, and Andy Jones does a, does a fantastic job. Very funny. Yeah. And Fonts helps Dave's out, Dave out by making up a story about a rare bird sighting, which begins to help Dave's right. business. Yes. Fonts is working on a prototype recreational submarine vehicle. <laughs> That's and right. Yeah. Concerned that uh, there's some people out to get them and so on. And it kind of yeah. all just goes from there. So the name of the rare bird in this particular movie was said to have been cited uh, in the movie as the Tasker Sulfurious. Is the Tasker Sulfurious a real bird? Uh, I'll go with no. No, it's not. It's fictitious. What real bird might the Tasker Sulfurious have been inspired by? Was it the extinct Labrador duck, the great auk, or the brown booby? <laughs> <laughs> Every episode you got one of these, don't you? <laughs> you and your birds. You got <laughs> Did anybody make a flute out of this bird? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. I'm going to say the great auk. 
No, it was the, the extinct booby? Labrador duck, which oh, okay. could have been could have been the same one that the fluke was made out of. Actually, okay, all right. So we mentioned Fonts yep. in the movie. Fonts, who's Dave's neighbor, attempts yep. to invent a submarine. Okay, he doesn't. He doesn't attempt to invent it. He actually invents it. Yeah, and he described it as I said as a recreational submarine vehicle, an RSV. Yes. What? RV company does Fonts believe is conducting industrial espionage to try to steal his plans <laughs> for this recreational submarine vehicle? Is it Coachman, mm -hmm. Winnebago, Airstream, or Keystone? Winnebago. Yes, right on. It's Save. the Winnebago. Good that job. Win Do you happen to know what happens to the RSV in the end? I'm going to say it ends up uh, in the bottom of the harbor. <laughs> <laughs> sort of does yeah yeah it, it blows blow up, up blows up i was gonna say it, it, it blew up. up yeah but thankfully yeah fonts survives fonts is out of that thing no death in this one fonts survives okay okay last last question what happens to the main character dave at the end of the movie and i'm going to give you four choices for this one without even asking okay does he close his restaurant and returns to his wife in washington mm -hmm. After the, the success of his restaurant, he decides to open up a bigger one in St. John's. Mm -hmm. As his new love, Alice, leaves for college, Dave chases after her taxi as she drives away. Or D, the RNC police find out about the con and they drag Dave away with the whole town standing and watching in disbelief. I don't remember the end too much, but I believe it was C. Indeed it was. Yeah. He runs or he drives after Alice as she's leaving for college, his new yeah. love. Yes. We'll end our trip to Hollywood North with a look at perhaps the biggest budget film ever filmed in Newfoundland about a Newfoundland topic. Mm. Do you know what it is? I would guess the shipping news. Yes, sir. The shipping news, $38 million budget. That is huge. Big budget filmed here in Newfoundland and um, huge Hollywood stars, Kevin Spacey, Kate Blanchett, Julianne Moore. Gordon Pinsent. Gordon Pinsent. The bomb. So the plot of The Shipping News follows main character Coyle and his young daughter Bunny from New York, where he works as an ink man for the presses of a local newspaper, all the way to Newfoundland following the deaths of his parents and the accidental drowning of his wife. So, you know, the action of the movie and then the, the items that take place when he comes to Newfoundland and really rediscovers his long lost Newfoundland roots mm -hmm. as a result and uh, goes through a process of personal discovery. What was the name of the world famous actress who played the role of Agnes Coyle's aunt? Wasn't Agnes the, the Dame Judy Dench character? Right again? Yeah. You, you, you did see this movie. You I did see movie, this right? movie. Yeah. I, I liked the movie. I liked the book even better. Annie Prue, uh, an incredible novel. Yeah. So you probably, you might get all of these, right? Well, let's see if it might be, might let's, make, let's, make, let's see. Let's, Let's see if you can run the table on this one. Let's uh, make up for uh, all the lack of answers I got on the rest of these sounds bloody like, questions. It sounds like you really like this movie and, and, uh, and had a big impression on you. So let's see if you can do that. So first, or the next question I should say would be the very first scene of the movie that's actually identified as being in Newfoundland mm -hmm. shows the main character, Coyle, on a ferry. What Newfoundland ferry is shown is he shown on? Is it the Beaumont Hamill, the John mm. Guy, the Hamilton Gray, or the Legionnaire? I'll say the Beaumont Hamill. Right again. Keep it going. All right. I'm on a roll here. You are. What community in Newfoundland is the movie filmed in primarily? Was it Outer Cove, Twillingate, Petty Harbor, or New Bonaventure? I feel like it was New Bonaventure. Right again. <laughs> The streak is alive. I am alive. You are alive. So Coyle in the movie, he decides to stay in Newfoundland, begin mm -hmm. a new life here in a long abandoned and dilapidated family cottage. Yes. You remember the scene where they walk into the cottage? A wicked it's spot. All... She's, she's lashed down even. She's lashed down. She's leaking. Oh, it's wicked. Barely a window into place. She's anchored actually. Yeah. By, yeah. by cables. Yeah. Yeah. The image of the house used in the movie is from a well-known Newfoundland and Labrador painting. Oh, what I should say, the image of the house that was used in the uh, movie trailers and stuff mm -hmm. um, shows a house being towed. And it's from a very 
famous Newfoundland print or mm. painting. Can you name the artist of the painting? And I don't know if you can you see the image in your mind. I can actually. Uh, who painted that though? So the hint is that it, it it's um, it's not color. It's a it's a, it's a black and white. Black and white. Well, it's like, like a, a uh, charcoal. Um, yeah. Was it done by Jerry? Um, I'm just Jerry forgetting. Squires? Jerry Squires. No, but I will no. give you one other hint. This gentleman um, really spent most of his life, like his adult life, uh, away from Newfoundland in Toronto, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. So was it Pratt? No. I'm uh, not going to get it. Not going to get it? And get uh, it. His, his roots are in, on the Bonavista Peninsula, I believe. Yeah. Or uh, not the Bonavista Peninsula, but in Bonavista uh, North area, I believe. Okay. And his name is David Blackwood. Oh, it's a Blackwood. Yes, yes. Yeah. And the painting actually is very famous. It's called ha Hauling Job Sturge's House. Done in, <laughs> done in 1979. Only 50 prints were made wow. of it. So Coyle shows a knack for writing once yes. he gets to this town, uh, for writing catchy headlines in particular. Yep. And he gets offered a job in... Um, the shipping news for a shipping news column for the local paper, mm -hmm. small little paper. What was the name of the newspaper? Uh, I thought it was called the shipping news. No, the shipping news is what he was writing. Oh, okay. Oh, so, but the, the paper had a different name. It was yeah. it the gamey bird. No, the offspray times the squid or the moose mandate. Again, with the Daryl-isms, the moose mandate. I'll go uh, with the squid and be wrong. The squid. Well, you would have been wrong with Offspray Times, too, because it was the gamey bird. The gamey bird? It was the gamey bird. I don't remember that. So in the movie, Coyle's first successful news article for the gamey bird is about a yacht. Do you remember the yacht? I do. That had visited the area. Very, very fancy yacht. The owners of the yacht tell Coyle that it's a botter yacht. Now, this particular boat was built in the Netherlands, for real, by the way. Okay. And this particular boat that's in the movie was said to have been built for a World War II leader. Who was that leader? Was it Churchill, Hitler, Roosevelt, or Stalin? Hmm. I'm going to say Roosevelt. And I'm going to say Wrong. no. <laughs> Hitler. But, uh, you know, I mean, it could have been either one of the four, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I mean, I mean like, I mean, let's, mind, let's mind down and give, give Kevin I don't a question know about, about a yacht in one scene. I don't know movie. about Churchill. Churchill didn't seem like the kind of guy that did much sailing to me. But uh, yeah. Roosevelt, uh, yeah, certainly Stalin. It was actually Hitler in the movie. So Coyle, as you know from watching the movie, becomes in romantically involved with Wavy Prouse. Great played by, name. Played by Julianne Moore, mm -hmm. who was a widow. On one of their dates, they're eating food outside from a local takeout. Yes. Wavy tells Coyle that the meal he is eating is a true Newfoundland food. What was the food that Coyle was eating? Seal flipper pie. Right on. Didn't even have to give you a multiple guess on that. Yeah. It was seal flipper pie. Now, my question to you is, have you yeah. ever eaten seal flipper pie? Yes. Well, have you? Have you? <laughs> I knew you were going to ask. <laughs> that would be a no. I have no. Not. But no. I do like seal. I, that sounds like it would be good. The author of the book that the Shipping News movie is based on is E. Annie Prue. Mm -hmm. She spends, or she did spend, I don't know if she still does or not, part of the year living in Newfoundland, Labrador. Yep. Do you know where she lives in Newfoundland, Labrador? What area of the province? Uh, Northern Peninsula, I think. True enough, yeah. Yep. Lives in a little community next to Lansom Meadows on the Great Northern Peninsula. Do you know this about E. Annie Prue, however? There's another very famous academy award-winning movie that she wrote the original story for do you know what the movie is and if, if you, you don't me, know it i can give you four guesses uh, if you give me four guesses i think i'll get it guess number one is broke back mountain guess number two is the artist guess number three is the departed and guess number four is million dollar baby okay so i maybe i won't get it but uh <laughs> I'll, I'll have a go at it uh, I think she could have written the original story for The Departed. She wrote the original story, which was a short story for Broke, Broke Back, Back Mountain. Mountain. That was going to always go with your first mind. 
Well, Daryl, boy, make no mistake about it. Uh, those are a great set of questions about incredible movies here in Newfoundland. But I think you know what time it is now. And that is time for our segment, World Famous in Newfoundland. And we're so excited uh, to shift now to welcoming our guest, Bud Davidge. Well, we're very excited to uh, bring this segment of World Famous in Newfoundland. Uh, World Famous in Newfoundland brought to you by Crooked Arse Creations. Uh, all kinds of uh, uh, beautiful stuff. Some you'll like, some you won't, whatever. He doesn't care. Crook he's a Crooked Arse, that fella. He's a Crooked <laughs> Arse. And uh, World Famous in Newfoundland. And I got to say, we got a fella on here today who is definitely World Famous in Newfoundland. If he's not World Famous everywhere. And that's our friend, Bud Davidge. Hello, Bud. Welcome. Hello, Kevin. How are you? Hello, Daryl. Hi, Bud. It's great to have you on. Thanks. Great, yeah. great to see you. Daryl and Bud, for those of you who are listening, they, they got this commonality, this thing, because Daryl's been hanging out on the south coast of Newfoundland for, I don't know, 30 plus years now. And, uh, and yeah, that's, that's plus, yeah. <laughs> and that's uh, Bud's stomping ground, right? Eh? So you two, you, you know the same berry picking grounds, don't you? Well, much the same. Now, yeah. Bud, I, I, I'm sure you, I, you're not idle, because every now and then I turn on the, uh, the, the YouTube or the, the news. And, the next yep. thing you know, up pops Bud Davidge, and he's got you know Chris Andrews pulling up on stage or somewhere else or whatever. <laughs> so what do you what do you got going on nowadays? What 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 do they what do you be at to keep yourself busy? You got stuff coming up? Well, well, we we started years and years ago, me and Sam Savory, but uh, that went up to nineteen ninety seven, and then afterwards I sort of took a break from it. But Chris got me back on a few <laughs> years back, probably five or six years to do a few uh, bits of uh, performing and all that, and ever since that. He's been calling me uh, off and on, and, uh, and I've been taking some uh, bits with him. Not very much, not really, but, you know, something to keep the rust from gathering, I suppose you could say. <laughs> and uh, doing a few uh, gigs now, I have a tribute show they're doing for our music, and that's going to run from the 5th of April till about the 12th, I think it is, across Newfoundland in the Arts and Culture Centres. So we'll be doing that, and of course, we got to come home here this summer, here they're promoting, and chances are I'm going to get called for to do a few gigs around. So there you go. There's always some little thing. I have no doubt. Pod. Among all the many things you got going on, bud, you take time out of your schedule to be with us too. Uh, so we really appreciate you taking this bit of time. And have you been studying, is the question. No, no, I haven't been studying other than... Um, I've been since COVID came in. I haven't been reading a book every week, but oh, uh, well. oh well. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but like they say down here, I'm a glutton for punishment. So <laughs> well, that's this kind of stuff. well. Let's 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 get her going. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna read okay. you guys five categories, and then I'm gonna flip a coin, bud, and you're the guest, so you get to call it. Uh, to see yep. who goes, see who picks the first category. And so here are our uh, five categories today. The South Coast, the government game, uh, which uh, for those who are listening to this and might not be familiar with that uh, uh, moniker, that's a moniker for the resettlement program that happened in Newfoundland. Forestry, uh, big industry in Newfoundland, Labrador, certainly was a very big industry at one time. And certainly Daryl and I, our father worked in the lumber woods for many years. So, you know, familiar with that. Mm -hmm. song lyrics because we thought well bud davidge must know something about song lyrics so we'll only ask you about your songs bud so there you go so oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> so the last category today is ray guy all right so i'm gonna flip a coin and, and you can call it bud what is it heads or tails oh heads is good heads it is you get to pick first <laughs> so i think i'll pick the south coast okay south coast is a good spot to start i got to say yeah First question goes to you, Bud, and if you should get it wrong, I'll offer Daryl the chance, and then and then he'll get a question about So Coast as well. And if he gets it wrong, you will get the chance. Yeah. In October 1940, Nina Skinner, accompanied by her husband Fred, boarded the coastal boat in McCallum to go to Harbor Breton. She was expecting her first child within days and wanted to be uh, at the nearest hospital to have her baby delivered. The baby had different ideas and arrived early on the boat with the help of a purser who stepped up and help with the delivery, he came into the world, Ronald G. Skinner. Ronald was named after the purser who helped her deliver the baby. His name was Ronald. His middle name was that of the ship on which he came into the world. What was the name of the coastal boat? Or if you like, what is Ronald G. Skinner's middle name? I can give you multiple guesses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was 1940. That was 1940. Um, 
So was it Gooseberry Bay, Glasgow, or Glencoe? Oh, it would have been Glencoe, of course. Yes, it was the it was the SS Glencoe. It was a part of uh, the infamous Alphabet Fleet. Okay. Right? Yeah. Of, of yeah. coastal boats, of which the Kyle was a part and, and many others. So I can just imagine what kind of a question he's going to ask me if that was the first question. <laughs> all right. God. All right. Settle down there, brother. And so, I, I think the next question is going to be what was the color of the, I don't know, the deck of the Glencoe? <laughs> no, no, no. What was Nina Skinner wearing? Yeah. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay, so Hermitage. The early settlers to Hermitage noted the resemblance of an offshore island called Hermitage Rock, a tidal island off the coast of their home. This rock was the supposed location of a 6th century hermit. The town and the bay are named after that rock. Where was back home for these settlers, Daryl? So are you looking for the country or are you looking for... Yeah, the country is good, yeah. I'm going to... I think... Uh, there's a couple of... I'm not giving you multiple guesses. There's, no, the there's no multiple guesses. You don't get multiple guesses. Screw you. Give me an answer. Well, it's an English oh. It's an English island. I'll give you English that. Island. Well, many of the settlers on the south coast are from um, uh, the Channel Islands. So I'm going to guess the Channel Islands. Yep. Where specifically, you think? And you said this to me recently, by the way. So. Uh, well, I, I happen to know this because... Uh, I think it's the Jersey Islands, right? That's correct. And, yeah. I, and I only know that because there's a, I think, uh, is it Jersey Harbor? Is a, is yeah, it was a that's settled right. town just outside of Harbor Breton, and, and my wife's grandmother was from there, and uh, so I okay. kind of know a little bit of, little yeah. bit of that. <laughs> well, that's it. And now, Bud, did you did you know that one, Bud? You would have known that. Um, I would have figured that, you know, um, the Jersey Islands. I know that a lot of people came from there, and as uh, Daryl said, uh, Jersey Harbor, right across from Harbor Breton there. Yeah. And uh, there was great connection between the Jersey Islands and Newfoundland. Yeah. All right, Daryl, you get to pick right. next, buddy. So uh, the remaining categories are the government game, forestry, song lyrics, or Ray Guy. I'm going to go with Ray Guy. Ray Guy. Yes, boy. <laughs> he was pretty dry, wasn't he? In his, yeah, arm, in, in his armchair on here and now. <laughs> I wonder what Joey would say yes. about this. He's, he, he loved he loved Joey Smallwood, didn't he? He was a big oh, fan right. of Joey. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. What, do you, what do you think, bud? Big fan of Joey? Oh, well, you made Joey's life a little bit of a, a bit of problem for Joey, I think, when he was writing for the Evening Telegram. I think he was. In the, in the 60s there. Yeah, I think at that yeah. time he was the official opposition, wasn't he? Oh, <laughs> so, he was yeah. indeed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Daryl, your question for Ray Guy is a little bit of a multiple guess. Uh, okay. You get to pick which one of these is not a Ray Guy quote. I've written just about everything for the sake of putting shoes on the children's feet and a bottle of gin in the cupboard. B, this satire business, that was one of the worst things that ever happened to me. I was a certified funny. From then on, I had to be funny. People expected it. Twice the work, same amount of pay. And C, stay away from philosophy, kids. It will ruin your mind. They all could be Ray Guy for sure. <laughs> yeah. um, I'll say C is not. It's C being stay away from philosophy, kids. It will ruin your mind. Well, you'd be right, because, and that was said by uh, another Newfoundlander, uh, Rex Murphy. Now, we got a multiple choice for you on Ray Guy as well, bud. Okay. So Ray was raised and schooled in Arnold's Cove and uh, the community that was to provide fodder for many of his columns, in fact. But the question is, where was he born? Was he born in Toslo, in St. Leonard's, in Come By Chance, or in Cupid's? I would say Come By Chance. I would say you're right, sir. There's no stumping Bud Davidge on this program today. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that is. Uh, I, I thought he. I thought he had been. He was born in uh, in Arnold's Cove, to tell you the truth. But yeah, but it was pretty close to Arnold's Cove. Pretty close, yeah. <laughs> All right, Bob. We go over to you now to pick the next category. We got the South Coast uh, uh, off and Ray Guy. So the the remaining categories are forestry, song lyrics, or the government game. Um, I think I must go. Uh, with the lyrics this time okay song lyrics song lyrics uh bud your question is great harbor deep what a what a community that was hey eh? got resettled yeah it was resettled at the turn of this century jp cormier wrote a, a heartbreakingly hauntingly beautiful song 
uh, yeah. about Great Harbor Deep. And uh, perhaps the most popular version of it is your buddy Chris Andrews and Shandy Ganuck. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. So let's let's test your knowledge of the song. Have you sung it? I haven't sung it, but I've heard it a good many times. All right. Well, that's a good go. I've heard, uh, heard Chris singing it. Here's here's a part of a verse. You 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 end it for me. Things were much better when I was a lad, when two working hands were all a man had. The sea was our mother. She called us from land. But now she seems like... I don't know it that well. Oh, okay. All right. So uh, let me go over to Daryl and give him a shot at it. Things were much better when I, uh, when I was a lad, when two working hands were all a man had. The sea was our mother. She called us from land. But now she seems like... Well, I never got a lyric right in my life, so I okay. don't know why I start now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have no idea. All right. The, uh, the sea was our mother. She called from the land, but now now she seems like a stranger. There okay. Yeah. 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 Daryl. Still sound that one, boy. All right, Daryl. Uh, well, this, uh, here's one for you, Daryl. And if you don't get this one, I feel confident that Bud Davidge will. Um, perhaps uh, um, one of the best lyrics in a song from Newfoundland, in my opinion, I absolutely love is from a song called Outport People. You know that one, bud? I uh, should. <laughs> <laughs> we have the writer of the song on the podcast. This is from... Uh, no, you're going to embarrass me now. Yeah, well, so, so we have, uh, in 1986, you and your, your buddy, Sim Savory, Sim and I, released yeah. an album of the same name, Outport People. That's right. uh, very successful album, yeah? To my mind, uh, one of the greatest lyrics ever in a Newfoundland song was this line that you use in the bridge. And this is for Daryl. Um, in the bridge of this great song, uh, Daryl's going to finish it because he is a song aficionado. <laughs> Don't take up a man from the life that he knows and tear up his roots and expect him to grow. Because if he's unwillingly forced to decide, what, Daryl? Uh, you're going to embarrass me <laughs> right in front of Bud Davis. <laughs> that was the plan. Uh, he'll leave. Let me hold on. He'll. You're on to it, Daryl. And he'll. Yep. The, I know the last part is he'll and he'll never arrive. Don't take a man from the life yeah. that he knows and tear up his roots and expect him to grow. Because if he's unwillingly forced to decide, he'll move without leaving and never arrive. That's you, got go. it. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. I, no, I, I, I needed it sung one more time. I wasn't planning on singing it, especially in front of Bud Davidge, but anything to help my brother along. <laughs> Bud? Tell, yeah. can, you, can, uh, can you tell us about writing that? Well, um, my family moved out of a little place called Beta Noor down in Fortune Bay. You probably yeah. hear the name now off on yeah. the oil rigs off there. There's a big oil well out there in the ocean. Yeah. And they call it Beta Noor. Well, our little town was called Beta Noor. And my fa family lived there and went to Fortune over on the Bureau of Peninsula in 1968. Mm. So the song was written in 1984 or 84 or roundabout and um, it was more of a, a reminiscing about what had happened yeah. in the case of many many of these people and it's, and my father and mother included in it so you know and and many of their friends too because quite a few of them moved fortune as well now they were happy over there but um, you know it always seemed like they like I said they left but they 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 didn't leave. They moved, but they didn't leave. You know that kind <laughs> yeah. of thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. They moved it, physically, but they didn't. Yeah. They didn't move uh, morally or no. Yeah. Or hearts and their souls were still back. Yeah. Spiritually. You know? Yeah. Daryl, you get to pick a category or no okay. government government gain or forestry. Oh well, let's do something I know very little about forestry. Okay, well, forestry it is then. <laughs> the second pulp and paper operation. Uh, yes. To open in Newfoundland was the uh, Anglo Newfoundland uh, Development Company, which we heard Dad talk about lots. The A and D Company uh, in Grand Falls, Windsor, in 1909. In 1925, another large mill was established in Cornerbrook by the Reed Newfoundland Company under the name Newfoundland Power and Paper Company. Mm -hmm. Where was the first pulp wood manufactured in Newfoundland in 1897? Uh, pulp or but no paper, just pulp. Pulp wood, yeah, but no paper. All I can tell you is the information I read said pulpwood. <laughs> Answer the damn question. You can delay all you want. <laughs> I don't. I don't think they produce paper. But um, uh, geez, uh, I, again, I don't really know the answer to this. I've, I don't think I've ever heard tell of this. I thought there was a pulp operation in Botwood, so okay. I'll go with that. 
Okay, that would be wrong. I'm just wondering if Bud's got a beat on this one. Um, I th- I was thinking Bart would too, to tell you the truth. Yeah. Uh, uh, remembering back in the old grade five geography books about yeah. in Newfoundland, probably it may have been in Humber or Curling or somewhere like that over around Cornerbrook. I, I wouldn't have expected either one of you to get this right, quite frankly, because it was a surprise to me. And this is what's great about doing this stuff on, on this podcast, because I'm learning as well. It was Black River, Placentia Bay was the first. Oh, hey. Yeah, it was the first pulpit operation in Newfoundland. So well, there you go. Well, well. Uh, How in the world did he get it to the paper mill, I wonder? I have no idea. I have no idea. I but, don't but, even know where Black River Presentia Bay is. And, no, uh, never no. tell it. Hey, no, no. Yeah, no, it's gone. Now. It probably we is gone now. Well, we all learned all something today. <laughs> that, that was a really easy question, Kevin, I got to say. Well, Daryl, I, I pride myself on picking easy questions for oh, you. That was, that was a really easy one. <laughs> okay, well, I got, a better, I got a better one for Bud, and it's multiple guests. <laughs> okay, here's your question. Uh, multiple guests. Throughout the first half of the 20th century, companies paid varying amounts of money for pulp wood. In 1926, uh, one of the things we know is loggers were notoriously poorly paid. So the loggers in 1926 earned between $2.30 and $2.50 per cord. Uh, That price actually dropped during the Depression to between $1.34 and $1.45. As prices dropped throughout the 30s, many loggers grew increasingly discontent and some stopped working uh, to protest the low wages. In 1934, the then commission government uh, conducted an inquiry into the logging camps. Uh, It produced a report, and that report uh, concluded that loggers were underpaid. (laughs) And uh, coming out of that, they said they they were overpaid, uh, underpaid and overworked, and they recommended that paper companies increase the loggers' net monthly income from $20.25 to what? $30.00? to $40, to $50, or to $60? What was their recommendation, you think? I would say 30. <laughs> okay. Uh, good guess. Not correct. What about you, Daryl? Uh, I don't know. I'll go down a limb and say, I don't know, 60? Also incorrect. The answer is $50. And interestingly, wow. uh, the government officials, again, feared the report would anger paper companies and spark a logger strike. Uh, so they instead asked the companies to pay loggers, pay them $25 a month in return for not publicizing the report, which they agreed to. And the report was kept private. So you just <laughs> asked us a question about something that was never published. That's right. Well, it did come out, Daryl. <laughs> right. I mean, it came out since you and I have been alive, man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. I told you about Bate. Where, where he gets this stuff, I don't know. All right. It's getting, de- it's getting devious with it, isn't it? I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So the last one is government game. Uh, the government game, for those who are unfamiliar, was uh, through uh, the, the uh, 50s and 60s uh, into the mid-70s, there was a, a program of, of organized uh, government resettlement uh, of people out of the communities. We spoke of the Great Harbor Deep song and outport people. Uh, that uh, sort of harkens to, to that reality. Um, and now there's a sort of a modern iteration of that as well as some of the uh, Great Harbor Deep, of course, was only in 2000 or 2001 or something like that. So the first resettlement program, this is for Daryl, ran from 1954 to 1965. Uh, The government would pay a cash payment of $150 per family at the start of the program, uh, gradually increasing that to $600 per family by the end of the program. They also paid for the expenses of moving. The second program ran from 1965 to 75. Uh, The new program was now administered by the Federal Department of Fisheries as a provincial federal partnership. And under the new program, assistance was increased along with moving costs. How much would a family receive for moving in that program, Daryl, if 90 percent and later that was reduced to 80 percent of the community voted in favor? Would they have received a thousand dollars per family plus two hundred dollars for each dependent? Would they have received B? $2,000 $2,000 per family plus $300 for each dependent. C, $2,500 per family plus $100 for dependent. Or D, $3,000 per family plus $100 for each dependent. Uh, I will go with the lowest one, though, given it's government and it's <laughs> and, and sure. they're benefiting Newfoundland. So I'll go with A. A is correct. They, uh, oh. they would have received. And, and was, this the the time, was this the time that your, your folks moved, bud? 
1968, yeah. Okay, so $1,000 they would have gotten plus $200 for each dependent. Yeah, and and did they two. And then would they have floated their, their house or what? Did they move the house? No, no in, my, in my case, in our case, uh, father, they left everything behind. Yeah. Uh, except what they took from outside, uh, out of the house. Right. And yeah. they went to Fortune and found a, found a place over there. Home. Yeah. Yeah. So the house, the there. house stayed there, did it, for years yeah, afterwards? Yeah, for oh. years. And we took it apart after a while and built a cabin oh. up on the river because we were right on a river there, a beautiful yeah. river. Yeah. And oh, yeah. So, I've, I've been up the Bay of Nord River, actually. Yeah. My yeah. brother in law has a cabin up there, actually. Yeah. It's a beautiful right. Spot. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Awesome. Beautiful place. Awesome. Well, not to worry, bud. You get a question about resettlement too, but yours is a more modern one. This is about the third SYZ. There was three iterations of this, and this is the newest okay. iteration, of course. Uh, state assistant relocation is still practiced in Newfoundland and Labrador, but the request now must come uh, from the communities themselves. The modern community relocation policy clearly states that the government cannot encourage or initiate any actions to promote resettlement. In 2013, the compensation was boosted from $100,000 to $270,000 per household. Since 2000, eight communities have relocated. Um, Great Harbor Deep, as we spoke of earlier, Petites, uh, Big Brook, Grand Breed, Round Harbor, Williams Harbor, Snooks Arm, and Little Bay Islands. The provincial government's community relocation policy was changed, lowering the vote for relocation now, this time, from 90% to 75%. Following that policy change, just last year in 2021, which community, population 64, voted against resettlement? McCallum. Oh, that's a good guess, because they did vote against it too, but, it, uh, uh, but I think that was a little earlier. This was last year was... Uh, Daryl, do you know I shouldn't give the answer until I ask Daryl? Uh, no, I don't know. No. Uh, Francois. Francois, yeah. Yeah, Francois. Yeah, I knew they voted against it, but I thought, yeah, okay. Yeah, so those are those are the, the questions. Bud, you're a great sport. We really appreciate you doing this. Uh, Thanks, it, it, it's, uh It's a real honor for me and Daryl to, to spend some time yeah, with you. It you're, is. you're a gift to this province, and uh, we're, we're thankful for you and everything you've done. <clears throat> I do. I got to jump in though, uh, but I've got a question about uh, one of your sons. Back, uh, I think it was the last episode we did. We we did a little piece on Semini, mm -hmm. and uh, we mentioned um, we mentioned the song, um, the uh, the loss of the Marion, or the, oh, the, yeah, the great song, right? And um, yeah. in researching that, um, I came across an intro to the novel that uh, this lady has written about the loss of the Marion. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not. I'm familiar with the book, but I never read it. So in the foreword of the book, she mentions that Ike Jones is, wasn't the name of the captain, that it was, the, he, I think his name was Isaac Skinner. Yeah, you know that's true. So yeah. my, my question was, why did it get changed to Ike Jones? Why did folk, the, the area use, do you, have you um, any idea? I don't know if anybody really knows the answer to that, but um, he, he, was a, he was a Skinner from Boxy. Okay. And... Um, Matter of fact, I knew his son uh, lived in Mulgrave, Charlie, mm -hmm. Charlie Skinner, and um, Charlie passed away some years ago. Great storyteller and all that. But anyway, I don't even know if Charlie knew the answer to that. But oh, wow. he was he was a bit of a, a guy who got around a lot. There was there was rumors that he had gone to the Klondike at one at one point in mm -hmm. his life. So he was a rover and a roamer, and somewhere along the way, I guess he must have picked up the the moniker of, of Ike <laughs> Jones for some reason or other. Yeah, so it was yeah. more like a, a nickname type thing. Was it, it was, as far as I understand, yeah, because there were no oh. Joneses down there at all in mm -hmm. in that area, as far as I know. Yeah. And I, I don't think it had anything to do with his family background or his pedigree or anything like that. Okay. So I, so I guess he picked it up somewhere along the way. <laughs> yeah. So in referring to him in years later, everybody just called him Ike Jones. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. and, that's, that's, and my grandmother was from Boxy, and uh, her brother was lost on the Marion. That's why I had oh, a special okay. interest in it. And um, we heard the story over and over growing up about how the, how the, uh, the schooner was, was, was scuttled 
by the French uh, captain out there. That's what they said, and that's what they concluded. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, once we got into, once I got into songwriting, I said, it's a great story. So I think I'll you know, look into it a bit more and uh, get some more details about it as much as I could from the older people, like you saw on the Land and Sea program there. Yes. Yeah. Uncle Cecil Blagden and Aunt Kiz Blagden from Boxy, they remembered it because it was 1915 when it happened, right? Yeah. 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 No, it's great, right. great story, no, great song. They, they had no evidence as to why he was called Ike Jones. <laughs> yes. uh, it was an interesting piece to, to it, though, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 He was well, sort of like a Wild Bill Acuff type. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. As a matter of fact, it was somewhere along the way, somebody said, you know, when he came home from down there, from way up in North, wherever, he brought a, a, a revolver with him. Oh, yeah. Oh. I didn't put that in a song. <laughs> the, I think it uh, sounds like it would make a great movie, hey? Yeah, I think it would. Right? I, it yeah. certainly would make a great play, and I've thought about it. Yeah. I've thought about it, uh, maybe doing it sometime or other, but I haven't, I haven't done wow. it yet. But it would make yeah. a great play. Well, yeah. I'm going to tell you, we can't talk about Newfoundland culture and heritage and song and history and everything else without knowing that one of the greatest contributors to all that, certainly in our generation, has been you, bud. And uh, we're grateful and thankful that you take time to be with us today. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. It's been fun. <laughs> yeah, it's been, a, it's been an honor and, and a joy to have you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Kevin, you know what time it is now? It is time for the lightning round. Always look forward to the lightning round. Got 10 questions for you. Okay. Uh, this time, all the questions are not on movies, but they're all on media. They're on uh, radio and okay. um, TV. Let me have all right, it. You ready? You ready to go? Start the timer. Make sure, because this goes by quickly. Okay. This radio station began broadcasting on June 15th, 1977. Mm, Oz FM. Right on. What is the name of the oldest radio station in Newfoundland? Mm, CJON. V-O-W-R. Oh, Voice of oh, Wesley Radio, 1924. Should have known that. Name one of the two men who founded CJON TV in 1951. Mm, Sterling. Jeff Sterling. Do you know the other? Uh, the other could be Harry Steele? No. Donald Jameson. Don Jameson. I should have known that. In what year did VONF Radio become CBC Radio? Uh, 1958. 1949. Oh, it actually did year it right away. Next one's really hard, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. How many radio stations are there in Newfoundland and Labrador? 12. 123. What? <laughs> there's, there's an online radio station on the Buren Peninsula. Do you know what it's called? Uh, the Boot. That's right. It is <laughs> called The Boot. Good for you. There is a Christian radio station broadcasting from Mount Pearl, not VOWR. Do you know what it's called? Oh, uh, Love and Light. It's called VOAR, the voice of Adventist radio. What do the call letters VOCM stand for? Drive safely, arrive alive. VOCM cares. Voice of common man. Voice of common man. Yes. <laughs> what Newfoundland Labrador open line host always signed off with the words, do something nice for somebody today. You'll feel better for it. Bye-bye for now. And God bless. Oh, well, God bless was always uh, Baz Jameson, wasn't it? Right on. It was Baz. Baz. That, that you, Baz? You, that you, Baz. And finally, what TV station aired the musical show, The Sons of Aaron? Oh, I feel like it was the CBC. It was NTV. NTV, really? Yeah, pretty good, Kevin. Those uh, some of them were a bit difficult, but yeah, I, I really like the fact that you got the boot. That was a good one. Yeah. No, anyway, good, listen, good we, we did good today. We I've learned a lot about movies today, and I didn't have my best performance today, but I'm going to come back strong next time. I feel like so. Um, a big shout out and thank you to our sponsors, to uh, Dildo Brewing Company and everybody there that does such a great job, and to uh, Crooked Arts Creations for sponsoring our segment, World Famous in Newfoundland. And, and of course, a shout out to thank you to Damien Vollett for the beautiful music you're about to hear again, because there's nothing else left to say, Daryl, except Wamba.